But before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when she had resolved to do this, the an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child convinced in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and he will name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All these, all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall have conceived and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Jesus awoke from his sleep, when Joseph awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Took her as his wife and had no mature really relations until her un, with her until she had born a son and named him Jesus. Hear the good news. Let us So I've, uh, I've uh, spoken of uh, Mary's role in Advent, uh, talked about that last week, but as it turns out, uh, Joseph also plays an important role in this story. And there are two things to know about Joseph right away. Joseph, like Mary, is young, very young. Um, Jewish boys could be betrothed at age 13 and girls at the age of 12. And yes, as the father of a 13-year-old, I find this terrifying. <laughs> right? I know they grew up quicker in those days, but still. Now, we talk about that as engagement. Um, but it was really, it was marriage for them. They were married, and then for a year they remained with their families to make that transition. And after a year, then they moved in together and started to live together. However you want to think about that, the short version is that there was a whole lot of teen pregnancy going on in those days. Now, the other thing that you need to know is that Joseph was a righteous man, as the scripture says. That means, uh, first of all, that he was law-abiding. He uh, follows the Torah carefully and faithfully. But he's a merciful man as well. He, uh, he could have shamed Mary publicly, or he even could have had her stoned to death. That was the penalty for adultery for women in those days. But instead, he chose to divorce her quietly. He doesn't seem inclined to getting revenge. And this makes him a remarkable young man. It was shameful in his day to be uh, to have your wife cheat on, to be seen as a cuckold, as they say. And yet, he gives up on that, and he's going to handle the matter quietly. Now, this is. There's this, uh, this kind of unsettling specter of violence in the background of this story. Some men like to prove their masculinity with the fists, especially if they're young and hot-headed and insecure. 
And that's particularly true, nowhere more true, than in societies where women have no power. It's exactly because an unfaithful woman challenges the power of men that the penalty is so severe for adultery. Now, I, I know what you, you're probably thinking at this moment. Dan, it is the Sunday before Christmas. <laughs> Give us something warm and fuzzy to think about. Preach on Santa Claus if you must. We're getting it. The point is that it is exactly those things that we want to carefully bracket out of the story so that we can concentrate on the baby Jesus. It is exactly those things that this story is about. It is exactly those things that make this story so important. Mary and Joseph are young. They are poor. And they live in a violent society. A man like Joseph, his life was not worth a hill of beans in his country. And a woman's life was worth even less. And the life of a baby was so iffy, it would just make you take a deep breath just to hear that someone was with child. And yet, this is exactly where God chooses to come into the world. In that moment when things could have been at their absolute worst. And yet, where people chose a different way. Joseph declines the path of violence. He chooses gentleness and mercy pushed along by that angel who tells him in a dream, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. But notice that that dream comes after he has made his decision. And in that decision, a new world begins. These days, you know, in the modern age, we get so hung up on how Mary got pregnant. Was she a virgin? Was she a young woman? What exactly did the Holy Spirit have to do to make her pregnant? But think of this as a matter of creation, not impregnation. The same Holy Spirit who makes Mary pregnant who brings Jesus into the world, that same spirit is the one who hovers over the waters before creation begins, way back in Genesis. In fact, Matthew uses that word, that very word. If you translate the start of our story literally, it reads, now the Genesis of Jesus the Messiah came about in this way, the origin of Jesus. And Genesis begins the Old Testament with the story of creation, but Matthew begins the New Testament with the story of a new creation. God is doing something new and wild and abrupt here. He is doing this unfettered act of grace and salvation. There are two miracles in this story. The first we know about, Jesus is born. And the second is that Joseph welcomes this child into his family. He accepts Mary as his wife, and he gives her child a name. That is, he claims him as his own. Joseph's selflessness allows God to enter into the world in flesh and in blood. And 
This is no accident. God comes to us in the fullness of time when we are ready to meet Him in mercy and righteousness and love. But we don't have to be perfect to meet God. It is one thing to await the birth of a son, and it is another to await the peace of God to enter into the world, to enter into our hearts. Or, you know, maybe it's not all that different. You know, speaking from personal experience, you're never really ready for a child. Even when you've had one, even when that kid is around and not yet quite adopted, you're never really ready. They change you in these unexpected ways. And still, we yearn and we long for them. We yearn and we long to meet them and to love them. Joseph anticipates the arrival of God's love through his love of Mary and of Jesus for this child that he has never met and whom he has no idea the origin of. And that's that same path that we are called to in Advent. We await the coming of God by making room in our hearts for him. There are many ways we can do that. We can act with generosity and mercy. We can make an open and friendly space in our hearts. We can feel the same yearning emptiness God feels until we are with Him and He with us. We can choose the difficult path of looking to the future with hope, joy. And perhaps the best path that we can take is the one that Joseph loved, which is to respond to the call to love a particular individual. There's an old German carol in which Mary sings to Joseph, Joseph, oh dear Joseph, mine, Help me rock the child divine. God reward both thee and thine in paradise. And Joseph responds, I will gladly, lady mine, help thee rock the child divine. God's pure light on thee will shine in paradise. So may God's light shine on us all. May we always be ready to rock that child divine. And may today God's new creation begin, remaking us 